I'm here today as a recruiter for Lucifer, you know, the devil. Uh, and I have to warn you that I'm going to get most of you, perhaps almost all, to commit an evil deed. And I'm going to do it in less than an hour. Now, I know you're saying to yourself, no way, not me, I'm not that kind of person. You're not that kind of person now, but you will be after I get you to do the dirty deed. The problem with thinking that you, you're invulnerable to these kind of social influences makes you even more susceptible to influence agents like me. Because what you have to do is you have to first understand the sensitivity we all have to situational pressures. So let me briefly take you back some years when I put good college students, many of them like you, normal and healthy, from all over the United States in a dungeon I created in the basement of the psychology department. <coughs> what we did was put good apples in a bad barrel. We want to see, does the goodness of people dominate the, ba the badness of the barrel, or do bad situations corrupt good people? Let's go back in time to look at what happened. In 1971, Phil Zimbardo conducted a revolutionary experiment here in the bowels of Stanford University in the United States. It rocked the world of psychology. A group of students were divided randomly into prisoners and guards and lived in a makeshift jail. The prisoners immediately became submissive and the guards became cruel. Within a week, Phil Zimbardo's prison was inhumane and the experiment had to be cut short. And this is how it all began. Prisoner 819 is being punished, Mr. Correctional Officer. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Well, you can keep your blankets and 416 will stay in another day. We got three against one. Keep your blankets, 416, you're going to be in there for a while. So just get used to it. I feel really fucked up inside. You don't know. I gotta go. I to a doctor. Anything. I mean, Jesus Christ! I'm burning up inside. Don't you know? I'm fucked up. I don't know how to explain it. I'm fucked up inside. Help it out! Help it out now! How could it be that a normal, healthy college student could have an emotional breakdown like that in 36 hours, when the guards were prohibited against using any physical punishment or torture? They broke them using verbal psychological means of dehumanization and other techniques that uh, we've learned from that research. He became a model of how you escape that evil setting because I had arranged for the Palo Alto Police Department to arrest the kids who were going to play prisoners in their dorms and in their homes because we wanted the state to take away their freedom. Had they come and said, I'm here for your experiment, that means they would voluntarily give up their freedom and they can say, I quit the experiment. You can't say, I quit your prison. So in fact, they realized the only way you could get out is by going to the parole board, which we had a parole board actually headed by an ex-convict with secretaries and people not connected to the study. But of course, the parole board always turns down your paroles, as happens in most times in real life. So when, when 8612 had a breakdown, he became a negative model for how you get out of this bad situation. Every day after that, for the next five days, another prisoner broke down and had to be released. So I ended the study and after six days. It was supposed to go for two weeks, but it had spun out of control. Normal, healthy boys playing the role of prisoners were becoming zombie-like, were having these emotional breakdowns. And again, other normal, healthy college students were behaving brutally, sadistically, uh, and, and at times doing things that were unimaginable. Before I did the study, there was an earlier study by my colleague Stanley Milgram, uh, which he did in New Haven, Connecticut. He tested 1,000 people, mostly men, old, no students, 20 to 50 years old. He also tested women. And what he did was he seduced people to do evil deeds by telling them they want, he wanted them to do something good. He wanted them to help improve other people's memory by shocking them when they made a mistake. We know that when you reward people for, for good behavior, they, they learn. But he said nobody studied the effects of punishment on learning. So he said, do you want to help us uh, learn about memory? People said, yeah. So again, a lot of evil starts with a false uh, story, a cover story, a false um, illusion. But what happened is you begin by pressing uh, the first volt. The first button is 15 volts. And all evil begins with 15 volts, stepping across that line between good and evil. Because when you look down the line, the last switch is 450. So you say to yourself, 
15 is nothing. And each, each increment is 15, 30, 45. And the, the guy you're helping is in the other room. He doesn't say anything. But when he gets to 100, he starts screaming and yelling, I've got a heart condition. And then he, he begins to yell, please let me out. And every one of the pr subjects turn to the experiment and say, sir, who will be responsible if something happens? The experiment says, I will be responsible. I'm the experiment. Te I'm the experiment. Teacher, you must continue. Who would continue under those circumstances? Who would go all the way? Who would go all the way up to 450 volts? 40 psychiatrists predicted only 1% of the American public would do that because that's sadistic behavior and only sadists would go all the way. They couldn't be more wrong because two-thirds, two out of every three people in that study went all the way up to 450 volts. Despite the person screaming and yelling, they behaved, they, they gave him what could have been lethal shock. There are many strategies and tactics that transform good people into perpetrators of evil. And we have a whole recipe. We can tell you a dozen things, that I, techniques we can use on virtually anybody to seduce them across the line between good and evil. So for example, blind obedience to authority as in the Milgram study. November 18th, 1978, the anniversary was two days ago. In Jonestown, Guyana, 921 American citizens, mostly from San Francisco and LA, committed suicide because they were blindly obedient to their Minister Pastor, Reverend Jim Jones, if you go on the web, look up Jonestown last hour, and you can hear the speech he gave to persuade these people, mothers kill your children, mothers kill your, your parents, and then kill yourself. But he didn't say kill, he said take the medicine. And the medicine was cyanide laced with Kool-Aid. Power of roles. In the prison study, we put people in roles. The prisoners and guard, there were, there were rules that they followed. Group dynamics, getting people to say it's part of being a team, diffusion of responsibility, we're all in it together. Every guy in a gang rape feels no, no remorse for it because we're all doing it. But most of all is dehumanization. Dehumanization is the tactic behind prejudice, discrimination, bullying. What it means is that you think of other human beings as less than your kind, less than your kin. You think of them as objects. And in the extreme, they're not only objects, they're animals or less than animals. Hitler persuaded the German people that Jews were vermin, like rats, and they're eating up all, all the, the wheat, all the supplies. A more recent example, in Rwanda, Africa, there were two groups living side by side, Hutus and Tutsis. The Hutus were the minority, but they were in power. And one day, the Hutu government went on the radio and said, we have an announcement. Your neighbors, the Hutus, are not neighbors, they're cockroaches. Imagine your house is infested with cockroaches. What would you do? Well, you kill them, of course. And he said, we're going to help you. We're going to give every man a machete and every woman a club, and you must kill the cockroaches. So it's just a metaphor, right? Except in 100 days, the Hutus massacred nearly a million of their neighbors. The weapon of mass destruction was a, a machete or a club. Their lives were not even worth a bullet. A second kind of evil is the evil that most of you and I have engaged in. It's called the evil of inaction. It's doing nothing when something is called for. So let's look at this powerful video. So when we do this demonstration, it's been done in many different countries, only about 10% stop to help. Okay? This research has been done with theological students at Princeton Seminary on their way to give the Good Samaritan address. You know about helping somebody in distress? When they thought they were in a hurry, 90% passed by somebody in an alleyway moaning who needed their, their help. So the point is, who are those 10%? We think of them as heroes. Heroes are people, ordinary people, who put their best self ser forward in service to humanity. They take an action, so heroism is always about an action that's, voluntarily, that, that's voluntary. They do it on behalf of others in need or in defense of a moral cause. And they do it aware that there's a risk or a cost. So altruism is heroism light. You give money, you make, give some blood occasionally, but it's really not a cost. 
and you do it without expectation of a tangible reward. So proactive heroes, and there are two kinds of heroes, reactive ones like Wesley Autry who jumped, jumped on a subway track in New York to save somebody had fallen across the track. So you react in the moment, impulsive heroes. The other kind of proactive heroes, heroes who think about a fraud or think about bullying, think about corruption, and typically work with other people uh, to organize the network against this. So proactive heroes are socially sensitive and they are mindful of their surroundings. So let's listen to Obama tell us what really makes a hero? You know, uh, what's remarkable about uh, history is uh, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Uh, you know, last year Rosa Parks passed away. Uh, and you know, I, I remember sitting on this stage with world leaders and Bill Clinton and senators and governors and, and thinking uh, we were all paying homage to a seamstress. Uh, who had transformed the country and, and helped transform the world. Uh, you know, we, we never know sort of how our actions are going to ripple uh, over time. Uh, but each of us can take some responsibility for making sure that uh, we are pushing a little bit in the direction of justice and, and in the direction of equality and the direction of tolerance. And uh, when we do that, uh, uh, we may surprise ourselves with the amount of influence that, in fact, we have just by standing up or speaking up. So heroes are ordinary people. It's the act of heroism that's extraordinary. And you do it by standing up against corruption, against evil, by speaking out, not being afraid to take a stand. In fact, uh, nine months before Rosa Parks did her dramatic refusal to give up her seat to a man on, on a, a segregated bus, there was a 15-year-old girl Claudette Colvin, who did the same thing. And she was put in jail and she said, it's my constitutional right to sit in any part of the bus uh, where I've, I, paid a, uh, I, I paid for my seat. She didn't become a hero because uh, the leaders in Montgomery, Alabama, including Martin Luther King, thought she was too emotional, that they needed somebody who was more stable and Rosa Parks uh, became the hero. Uh, and Claudette Colvin just has a, a new uh, autobiography which she describes her experience. So a 15-year-old girl can be a hero as well. So on the bell curve of humanity, heroes and villains are the outliers. They are the extremes. There are relatively few of them. Most people, most of us, are in the general population between. The problem we face is villains are organized and resourceful. They are influence agents. They are the sex traffickers, the corrupt people, the fraud, fraud, people who promote fraud, uh, drug dealers, gang dealers, the mafia, on and on. On the other side are heroes. They're humble, they're modest, they don't have any resources, and they're not organized. So that's where our, our new heroic imagination project comes in. Because in the war be, uh, between good and evil, where we're fighting over the hearts and minds of the general population, what we have to do is teach people, and we're doing it on our website, we're doing it in new classes that uh, Clint Wilkins, our educational director, is, is providing, and some of the students who introduced me are in those courses, to teach people how to get fortified against the lure to the dark side. We're trying to do it in fun ways, with video clips, with entertaining things, because their power is palpable. Everything we've learned from all those years of doing research in social psychology, the prison study, the Milgram study, the Ash study, we have all those lessons there. Then we want to inspire them to the bright side with examples of people just like you who've done heroic things, ordinary people doing extraordinary deeds. And then we want to coach you how to be a wise and effective hero. So our program was just started, our website, I'm going to ask you to visit, I'm going to ask you to join our group. Uh, our purpose is to transform the egocentric me into the sociocentric we. Heroes, even though we celebrate them as individuals, are really socially focused. Heroes are sensitive to other people and come to their need uh, when uh, opportunity calls. So here's the final challenge. I think that almost any one of you could be a hero. And we hope that you will be the hero in your own story. We'd like you to go to www.heroicimagination.org and join the Heroic Imagination Project. How are you going to do it? Easy. We have a hero pledge. We'd like you to sign up, sign up with two of your buddies. Uh, and we have a course, a four-week course online. But we have lots of projects. We're going to have eco heroes and health heroes and tech heroes, disability heroes. We're trying to tap into all the kinds of things that young people could get excited about, all the things you've heard today. What we're trying to do for the first time is use the website to teach people how to be change agents. 
It's one thing to say, be a change agent, go do it. But you have to be aware of what are all the things that block good intentions from good actions? What are all the things that can facilitate you? So we know working in groups, we know getting rid of the set cynicism, skepticism, it's all just me, what can I do? You can't do much alone, but in a group, in an ensemble, in a network, you become a classical orchestra that can make beautiful, beautiful music. Uh, so take the Hero Pledge, and then next to it it says you can take our course, but we have a ton of new information on our website. And so join me in resisting the evil force and becoming heroic. The evil force is palpable, and, but you can resist it. And last but not least, in the super epic takedown of evil versus good, we want good to triumph, and it w can be with people like you, especially the, the energy of youth, to take, to take down all the evil in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you.